Um, my background was, was said before, I was trained, uh, my dad was an army ranger. I, I moved every year of my life. I distinctly remember my father going to Vietnam in 1965. And again in 1967, I remember uh, there was a squirrel we had shot. He was teaching us to shoot rifles and there was, you know, we were hunting or something. And I felt bad for the squirrel. I did feel bad for the squirrel. And this, my dad was kind of doing a little, you know, showing us the internal organs and everything. And I said to my dad, well, you're going off to Vietnam. That's over in Asia. But they could kill you. And he goes, yeah, they, they, they could. They, they won't get me, though, you know, because, and, and I said, but they could get you, right? And my dad said, yes. And he, and he looked at me and said, but there's, there's many things worse than death. Really, without delay, he said this. And I said as a kid, well, what could be worse than that? He goes, well, letting down the team. That, that's totally unacceptable. Uh -huh. Whatever you do, don't let the team down, <laughs> son. No kidding, 40 years later, within a month or two, my son saw a dead sparrow in Washington State, and, and he said, hey, aren't there negative guys in Iraq? He calls terrorists negative guys. It's as good as any attorney. Mm -hmm. They're very negative, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, they might try to get you. And I said, they might, but they won't, hoping you go on to a different subject. And he goes, but they could get you, right? He's a six-year-old. I said, they could get you. He goes, and then you'd be dead and you'd go to heaven like the sparrow, because he was going through Catholic training. And I said, yes, yes, I'd be in heaven like the sparrow, thinking that would surely do it. <laughs> and he goes, what if the negative guys come to America? Well, I have to fight them. And I looked at him, and I was at an existential moment. I could have pawned it off. That won't happen. We have a police department. I looked right at my six-year-old, and I said, yes. And he goes, and they could kill me, right? I said, absolutely. And I said, that's okay, because there's many worse things than death. Letting down the team is far worse. Now, folks, what I'm going to talk to you today, today about is something that may seem strange, but I'm going to make an argument that Stoicism is not only alive and well in the military, but it's necessary for the military, specifically the United States military, which has a Greco-Roman background. If you go to West Point, the patch you wear is, a, is, a, um, is, a, is the Greek helmet, is the classic Greek war helmet. You'll see it on the side. Um, the most, one of the most popular movies soldiers watch is the movie 300. Why? Mm -hmm. What is it that's so appealing to them about it? Is it the yeah. slow motion action? Is it the Scottish buffed out digital effects? <laughs> or is it the other stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, Spartan with your shield or on it. What is it about antiquity that so appeals to soldiers? So here I am, I get to Iraq in 2005, and I've got to find a way to make mental health seem interesting and vital to people that really didn't want to hear it and were suffering, and some of them were already been on their second and third combat tour. I decided with my training in rational and motor behavior therapy that I needed to take RABT, but I needed to also connect it to the ancient warrior tradition. There was only one thing I could use to do that, and that was Stoicism. <laughs> and the term Stoic was largely unknown by soldiers, and the older ones knew their grandfather had been Stoic, said their grandmother, or somebody said, yeah, these guys don't show a lot of emotion. But I found that people t that knew the word Stoic tended to be over 30. Soldiers really didn't generally know that term, but they had all seen the movie 300. And when it comes to helping people or alleviating suffering, I'm shameless. First of all, if you were a soldier, we would have come to you. You might be on a remote outpost in Afghanistan. You may, you may be in somewhere in Iraq, northern Iraq. We would literally fly in by helicopter or take a convoy, preferably take a convoy so we could talk to soldiers. Psychiatrist, social work officer, and a couple of enlisted soldiers would show up. And they would be in your area for a couple of days. And, they, and what you'd hear was this fellow, Major Jarrett, wanted to teach you a course called Warrior Resilience and Thriving. First thing you do is say, if I can be a little graphic, fuck that. Uh, no, I'm not interested. They're not going to get in my head. Uh, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And the first thing you notice is the class was mandated. Nobody got out of it. Lieutenant Colonels didn't get out of it. We spent a lot of time talking about honor and virtue with combat soldiers. And the first thing I want to say is, um, I don't know, like I can't speak for any other foreign militaries, but a lot of people join the army because they want to be part of something virtuous. It's not just economic necessity. It, it, it's a factor, but also it's a sense of wanting to do something. Look at the materialistic culture we live in. There's people that feel they feel like automatons, like they're just doing the same old thing. Somebody once posited that people do body art, tattoo, and dangerous sports because they want a sense of being vital or having some kind of ritual. Now, I don't know what percentage of people in the military came in just for economic necessity, but I know the ones I'm associated with actually consider themselves warriors, professional soldiers. We had some goals uh, with our resiliency training. Our first goal was to enhance the resiliency of soldiers and uh, teach them about post-traumatic growth. Has anybody here turn, heard the term post-traumatic growth? PTG. So it's really important term to know. Yeah. Because post-traumatic growth is more likely to occur than post-traumatic stress disorder. It means to go through suffering and to grow in a spiritual dimension, 
to grow as far as cohesion, to learn about yourself. It's a very ancient principle, which is to be made stronger by everything you go through. It's also a very stoic principle as well. Um, we also wanted to um, impart to the soldiers a way to make sense of their experience, teach them a little bit of that ABC theory. We'll talk about that later, and, I, and I'll go over the model a little bit. I mean, you know, and I was trained by Dr. Ellis. But we couldn't stop there. We wanted to promote the Army values. Now, if you were a soldier going through the course, here's something you might not have. Can you kind of see that? Here you are coming for a combat stress lecture, and your, your major is standing in front of you talking about character, talking about moral excellence. What gave me the right? What gave me the right is the fact that chaplains aren't teaching it. Okay, I'm not trying to be provocative here. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is you might have run into a chaplain that would personally talk about it, but you, want, you know what the Army's typical character ethics classes are? They're ridiculous. It's usually a burned out lieutenant colonel that comes out and gives you some sort of a mandatory check the block training. It's uninspiring and you can't relate to it. We wanted ethical behavior to be considered something that incited and interested soldiers. Like, wow, you know, if I don't do this, I probably will suffer. We'll all suffer. So we taught them this. We said in ancient theories, virtues were dispositional and character strengths were developed through habit of choice, repetitively doing the right things. The Marines call it ethical muscle memory. So we have some insights. I'll give you the first one. The first one, and you can't see it, but there's a lovely uh, picture of the statue of Thermopylae, was expect and prepare for adversity and hardship by developing resilient character strengths and virtues that will assist you to thrive. Expect to suffer. Expect pain. To be a soldier is to be in a certain measure of pain. To go through soldierly training is to go through pain. We blatantly infi inflict pain on soldiers to help them to be ready for battle. A friend of mine was in Spetsnaz, which is special forces for the Russian, Russian military, and he said they did their obstacle courses in the middle of the night when they were very tired, and as they got to the top of the obstacle, they'd reach up and they'd reach into entrails and blood and parts of pigs. And then they'd go through a trough full of, full of intestines. And they said by the time they were fighting in Chechnya, the first time they saw a very, very bad combat, they were very used to seeing human entrails, or seeing what looked to be human entrails. The military is in a big desensitization game. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to get you to where you can see obscene things and continue to function. Now you might say that seems inhuman, but really think about what they're training people to do. They're training people to see carnage, get over there, keep their mind relatively calm, and get back. So when we talk about that, the first question that arises is stoicism in a sense, are we paying a price for stoicism? This is an interesting thought, I think. Well, you, you tell me what you think. The, and of course, the first people against stoicism, <coughs> stoicism will say, "Well, you're you're killing, you're extirpating, you're extirp extirping, has ext extirpating the emotions." But are they? We'll talk more about that. I would say that stoicism allows us to actually have what I call the right pounds per square inch psi of emotion for an event. There's a time to be very emotional and grieve, like the ancient Spartans, and then there's a time to be fairly non-emotional. You have to have your emotions in check when you're seeing people suffering around you. You also have to have your emotions in check when you have the ability to make people suffer and you need to observe the rules of engagement. It's important that when we talk about resiliency, and it's not just about stoicism, that we use our words well. For instance, when we taught soldiers, we taught them that, in, that our definition of resiliency included the word endurance, being able to endure with dignity and honor, season after season, a very stoic concept. Um, Resiliency was defined as the ability to bounce back uh, from what you've been through. Those of you who studied martial arts know it as blending and then coming back to your original form. But we also, when we taught, and this is but different, up to the point that I was teaching in 2005, the military was not connecting mental health specifically with character. Somebody had a problem with character, well maybe they could talk to the chaplain, if they talked to the chaplain. The point of the matter is, we made an argument that character, moral excellence, and we use that term with soldiers, was as indispensable for resiliency as any possible psychological technique we could teach them. In fact, if you lacked character, you probably you, you were at risk for committing war atrocities. Developing PTSD doesn't mean you lack character, but it affects your character. Jonathan Shea wrote a book called uh, Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus in America and said that combat undoes character. Other people have suggested that, uh, that combat shatters our assumptions, the assumptive world, the world's safe, good people do well. A very common one for soldiers is the belief that children shouldn't suffer. 
And when American soldiers see the bodies of children blown on roofs, I don't know if you know it, but the IEDs are so powerful in the Middle East that sometimes you'll find, they'll find the torso of a child on a roof. It's very disturbing to the average American soldier. Immediately what comes to mind are beliefs like, why should children suffer? But let's think about the stoic uh, spiritual exercise of kissing our, our child in the morning and saying, in a sense, by the gods you come to me, I have no idea how long you'll be with me. Try that one. Because there's a lot of fair-weather Stoics. There's a lot of people that fancy Stoicism when they're in Starbucks. The question is, will it work for you if your child takes, becomes ill, if your child's captured? One of the things we told soldiers from the start was, if your philosophy would not work in the most dire circumstances, abandon it today. It's a waste of your time. I said it and challenged people. I said, you don't have to adopt my philosophy, but your philosophy, first of all, you have to know that you have a philosophy. Secondly, you might want to know what it is. And thirdly, if it doesn't work in the most dire of circumstances, it's kind of a Starbucks philosophy. Listen to the definition of post-traumatic growth. Enhanced functioning and positive change after enduring a trauma or adversity, including enhanced personal strength, spirituality, relationship, team cohesion, cohesion courage, and wisdom. I'd like you to listen to those terms again in terms of what to stoic brotherhood and sisterhood is after and see if they map into Enhanced personal strength, spirituality, relationship, cohesion, courage, insight, and wisdom. It sounds like a definition of the sage's path. And yet, the path to that is a description of what we go through when we've been through post-traumatic growth. Now, there was no Stoic that used those terms, nor was there a Stoic who was developing, um, specifically, a research institute for resiliency. But many, many believe that Stoicism was the most robust of ancient philosophies. In fact, it was unequaled as a resiliency. In fact, when I sold it to the army, what I said is, you know, yes, we can go to UPenn and perhaps they have a new program, but I've got something that's got, you know, 2,300 years of human application behind it. And they said, well, what do you mean, Captain? Well, I said, Frederick the Great never went on campaign without taking the works of Epictetus. Uh, Washington considered himself a Stoic, personally. People throughout the, you know, armies throughout history have had have certain aspects of instilling Stoic ideals. Nancy Sherman, a colleague of mine, wrote a book called Stoic Warriors. She made an argument that she went to the Annapolis to teach them about ethics, and she was the one that received the education. Because they taught her that the military lives and dies by, at least the American military, tries to live and die by the idea of moral excellence. And there's many outrages. Nobody's more offended than professional soldiers when lives are wasted with fruitless or frivolous military campaigns. Soldiers are precious resources. And one of the reasons I went back in the Army is, is I wanted to sort of ensure that they were used well or at least taken care of. We wanted soldiers to know, and we're going to move quickly, that virtues and vices were both chosen based on what we perceived as right action. We were in the business of defining right action. Mm. Right action, if you're a special forces medic, is to, is to shoot somebody in a firefight and then immediately tend to their wounds, which is very common. You know, it's like this person that shot you is also a senior trauma specialist and they're immediately bandaging you. It's, it, it's, it's phenomenal. But that's, that's the level. Everybody has a modern car here? Maybe? I mean, most of our cars are less than five years old. Have you ever thought about how incredibly durable they are? Our little Honda CRV needs to really accelerate onto the freeway, but it better take me up in the mountains. And by the way, it better be a quiet car, it better be economically, it has to do it all. And that's what soldiers have to do now. They have to be very violent, and then they have to come back and play nice for about 12 to 15 months. They need to be violent again. And by the way, don't abuse your family, and don't become an alcoholic, and don't you know, lapse into lethargy. How do they do it? What they have to do is they have to have a philosophy that allows them to suffer, and not even look at it as suffering specifically. And before you imagine I'm, I'm making an argument for masochism, we need them to think about their suffering as a sense of service. So when somebody says, hey, you know, how do you train people to do this? It's a good question. Because you have to train them to realize that their physical discomfort, the pain they go through, and what they're willing to do, including part with their life, is, is a worthwhile thing to be doing for the Republic. And, and actually, one of the things I personally believe, and I hope it doesn't sound dramatic, is I don't believe my, family, my family's welfare is as important as the Republic. I, I don't. I don't think my life is as important as a republic. And if I sound like I'm brainwashed, so be it. But if I thought anything less, I couldn't be a professional soldier. I have to imagine that my son moving every year, me going to combat, my life, my welfare is not as important as preserving the country. I have to believe that. It's really important for you to hear that. Because if I don't believe that, I'm playing it soldier. 
Now, the day I stop believing it is the day I get out of the military. I really need to resign my commission the day I, cannot, I can't do that anymore.